Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Thursday, October the 1st. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice, joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ. We have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 6. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their feasting, fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness! No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you so anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And our Book of Concord reading tonight is from Articles seven and eight on the church in the reader's edition of the book of concord article seven and eight of the apology of the augsburg confession but the wicked are not christ's kingdom even though that revelation had not yet been made for christ enlivens his true kingdom by his spirit whether it is revealed or covered by the cross just as the glorified Christ is the same Christ who is afflicted. Christ's parables clearly agree with this. He says the good seed is the children of the kingdom, the weeds are the son of the evil one, the field, he says, is the world, not the church. John the Baptist speaks about the entire Jewish people and says that eventually the true church will be separated from that people. 
Therefore, this passage is more against the adversaries than in favor of them, because it shows the true and spiritual people are not to be the true and spiritual people are not to be are to be separated from the earthly people. Christ also speaks of the outward appearance of the church when he says the kingdom of heaven is like a net, Matthew thirteen forty seven. Likewise, ten virgins, Matthew twenty five. He teaches that the church has been covered by a lot of evils, so that this stumbling block may not offend the pious, and so that we may know that the word and sacraments are powerful even when administered by the wicked. Meanwhile, he teaches that these godless people, although they have fellowship in outward signs, are not Christ's true kingdom and members. They are members of the devil's kingdom. We are not dreaming of a platonic state, as some wickedly charge, but we do say that this church exists, truly believing in righteous people scattered throughout the whole world. We add the marks, the pure teaching of the gospel and the sacraments. This church is properly the pillar of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. For it keeps the pure gospel, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.11. The foundation is the true knowledge of Christ and faith. There are also many weak persons who build upon the foundation stubble that will perish, holding certain harmful opinions. Nevertheless, because the weak do not overthrow the foundation, they are both forgiven and corrected. The writings of the Holy Fathers declare that sometimes even they built stubble upon the foundation, but that this did not overthrow their faith. But most of those errors do overthrow faith. Our adversaries defend these errors. Among them is their condemnation of the article about the forgiveness of sins, in which we say that the forgiveness of sins is received through faith. Likewise, it is a clear and deadly error when the adversaries teach that people merit the forgiveness of sins by loving God before grace. This is an example of removing the foundation, Christ. Likewise, why do we need faith if the sacraments justify by the outward act without a good motive on the part of the one doing them? Just as the church has the promise that it will always have the Holy Spirit, so it also has warnings that there will be wicked teachers and wolves. Acts 20, verse 29. Yet the church in the proper sense has the Holy Spirit. Although wolves and wicked teachers run rampant into the church, they are not properly Christ's kingdom. Just as Lyra also testifies when he says, the church does not consist of people in power or ecclesiastical or secular dignity, because many princes and archbishops and others of lower rank have been found to have apostatized from the faith. Therefore, the church consists of those persons in whom there is a true knowledge and confession of faith and truth. We have said nothing more in our confession than what Lyra says here. The adversaries perhaps require that the church be defined in the following way. To them, the church is the supreme outward monarchy of the whole world. In this church, the Roman pontiff's power is unquestioned. No one is allowed to argue against it or criticize it. He sets up articles of faith or abolishes them and abolishes the scriptures according to his pleasure. He approves worship ceremonies and sacrifices to frame whatever laws he may wish. He dispenses and exempts from whatever laws, divine, canonical, or civil, that he wish, that he may wish. From him, the emperor and all kings receive their power and right to hold their kingdoms according to Christ's command. It must be understood that this right was transferred from Christ, since the Father subjected all things to him, to the Pope. Therefore, the Pope must necessarily be lord of the whole world, of all the kingdoms of the world, of all things private and public. He must have absolute power in earthly and spiritual things and both swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Besides this definition, not of Christ's church, but of the papal kingdom, has also as its authors, not only the canon lawyers, but Daniel eleven thirty six to 39. Now, if we would define the church in this way, we would perhaps have fairer judges, for there exist many excessive and wicked writings about the Pope of Rome's power, for which no one has ever been charged. We alone are blamed because we proclaim Christ's graciousness, that by faith in Christ we obtain forgiveness of sins, and not by worship ceremonies created by the Pope. Furthermore, Christ, the prophets, and the apostles define Christ's church very different from the papal kingdom. Neither must we transfer to the popes what belongs to the true church, as though the popes are pillars of the truth who do not err. How many of the popes care for the gospel or judge that it is worth being read, Many in Italy and elsewhere even publicly ridicule all religions. Or if they approve anything, they approve only things that are in harmony with human reason. They regard the rest like fables and like the tragedies of the poets. According to the scriptures, we hold that the church, properly called, is the congregation of saints, 
who truly believe Christ's gospel and have the Holy Spirit. We confess that in this life, many hypocrites and wicked people are mixed in with these. They have the fellowship and outward signs, are members of the church according to this fellowship and outward signs, and so hold offices in the church, preach, administer the sacraments, and bear the title and name of Christians. However, the fact that the sacraments are administered by the unworthy does not detract from the sacrament's power. Because of the call of the church, the unworthy still represent the person of Christ and do not represent their own persons, as Christ testifies, the one who hears you hears me. Luke 10, 16. Even Judas was sent to preach. When they offer God's word, when they offer the sacraments, they offer them in the stead and place of Christ. Those words of Christ teach us not to be offended by the unworthiness of the ministers. In confession, we said clearly enough that we condemn the Donatists and, Wycl and Wycliffites. They thought that people sinned when they received the sacraments from, unworthy, from the unworthy in the church. Let me try that one more time. In the confession, we said clearly enough that we condemn the Donatists and the Wycliffites. They thought that people sinned when they received the sacraments from the unworthy in the church. These points seem for the present to be enough for the defense of our description of the church. Neither do we see how, when the church, properly called, is named the body of Christ. It should be described differently than we have described it. For it is clear that the wicked belong to the devil's kingdom and body. He drives them on and holds them captive. Such things are clearer than the light of noonday. However, if the adversaries continue to pervert them, we will not hesitate to reply at greater length. We'll stop there for this evening. Get up tomorrow. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, true King of heaven and earth, you promised to your church that the gates of hell would not prevail against her, and you still cause your word to be preached and your holy sacraments to be administered among us. But, O Lord, the sins of your people obscure the majesty of your bride. Your holy vineyard is trampled, and your blessed sacrifice stands neglected. Many think themselves strong and despise the life-giving food that you have ordained for your people for the forgiveness of their sins. Pardon all our arrogance, and do not come to us in wrath to remove the lamp of your word from before our eyes. O Lord, we pray you, visit this vine which you once established for yourself, and renew us with the sun of your mercy and the water of eternal life. Give us a great hunger for the food of your true body and blood, and let all your faithful people ever be found in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, in the breaking of your bread, and in the prayers. We implore you, O Lord, for our altar, that it may ever be a place where the medicine of eternal life, the forgiveness of our sins, strengthens us in body and soul, that disbelief and impenitence may stay far from all who come there, so that they may not eat and drink to their own judgments. O eternal High Priest, let the fruit of your Spirit grow in us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and chastity. Cause us to live in holy conduct toward one another to the glory of your holy name. here in time, and hereafter in eternity. For you live and reign with the Father and the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Eternal God, you counsel us not to be anxious about earthly things. Keep alive in us a proper yearning for those heavenly treasures awaiting all who trust in your mercy, that we may daily rejoice in your salvation and serve you with constant devotion. 
through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.